Hey everybody, this is Charlie Dobbins. I want to welcome you to another uh, one of the uh, Multifamily Investing Academy's Masterclass Elite Group Coaching Calls. Now this particular call is going to be kind of an educational call. Uh, I think the next uh, call we do is going to be an interview, another one of our interview calls with, with an investor. Um, the reason for this particular uh, discussion, understanding multifamily financial statements. Now, if you've been in the, in the uh, master class program, uh, it's typically in the fourth month you will be given the training program on uh, how to read a multifamily financial statement like uh, better than your accountant. And uh, this particular discussion, we are not going to get into that full uh, analysis. That particular educational program is four videos. Uh, it's almost two hours worth of training on multifamily financial statements. But the reason why we're going to be talking about it uh, on a particular aspect of it on today's call is because I've had two conversations with students uh, regarding particular aspects of the financial statements. And I think it's important that I, I explain to you what those conversations were and uh, and why we're going to be go going over them today. The first one was with a student probably about three or four months ago, and he had asked me for a, um, a listing of all of the expenses that you could typically see on a multifamily statement. And if you understand how the property management systems work, like Rent Manager or Yardi, uh, you create a chart of accounts the same way you do with QuickBooks. Uh, you create a chart of accounts and you can get as creative as you want. So when he asked me for that, you know, my first reaction was, oh, I can't, there's no way I can give you all of that information because it's only going to come back and haunt me because you're going to tell me that I didn't tell you about this particular uh, expense. And so, you know, as an attorney, I kind of looked at it from a liability standpoint. I'm going to, you know, I'll have an issue if I tell him this is this is the list. This is the list of expenses. So uh, but I've since think that I've kind of figured that problem out and you're going to find out the answer right now. And of course, you know, as an attorney, what I've decided to do is shift the liability to a, th a third party and blame it on them. So that's the first part of this discussion as far as financial statements. The next part of the discussion has to do with a conversation I had with a student yesterday regarding capital expenditures. Now, let me explain to you what happened in his particular case. He's trying to come up, come up with an offer on, on a property. He happens to be in the owner form, so I'm helping him uh, draft the letter of intent and make sure that, uh, that it goes out uh, the right way. He is off on the from the purchase price by you know a considerable percentage and the seller says well no you you have to understand something um some of our expenses should be carved out because they're not really operating expenses they're real really capital expenditures so those should not be included in your noi calculation and when you take those out uh um you know the noi goes up and our purchase price goes up and so here, let me show you. And he sends over an Excel spreadsheet with 850 lines of expenses, and he highlights those that he says should be excluded. Now, my first issue is with the fact that we are doing his accounting for him. And it just seems wrong to me that, that we are helping him get to that particular number. His accountant should have done this you know, long before uh, he decided to sell the property. His books should be cleaned up. Uh, so that we don't have to guess as to what, what capital expenditures, expenditures are. Now, my client and I kind of went back and forth as to was this an expenditure, was this a CapEx, was this not a CapEx? And uh, so I decided to show you where you can find what is a CapEx and what isn't a CapEx, but there's, there's a little bit more of an art to it than a science. So that's what we're going to be talking about in today's discussion as far as financial statements for multifamily property. All right. So here's my disclaimer. You always going to hear this one. I'll say it again. I'll say it a million times. That way nobody can ever say I didn't say it. I'm a lawyer. I'm not your lawyer. Get a lawyer. Get a lawyer in the jurisdiction that you're doing um, the property, buying the property in. I will help and work with your attorney uh, every step of the way, uh, but I cannot represent you. And I'm very clear about that. So what role am I playing here? I'm your consultant. I'm your coach. Um, I hate coach for consultant. Uh, but I will uh, act as if I am an attorney 
uh, I will conduct myself in that manner. I'll make sure that, uh, you know, I'm going to cross all the T's and dot, dot the I's. So that's my disclaimer. All right. Now, let's talk first off about what is a capital expenditure in multifamily, because this is where we were kind of going off the rails a little bit yes, in my conversation with my student yesterday. Now, capital expenditures are funds used to upgrade physical assets that are not part of normal repairs and maintenance. This type of capital outlay is made by companies to maintain or increase the property. Capital expenses have a useful life and can be depreciated. All right, now I got this. Did a little search on the internet for capital expenditures for multifamily, and I got this from this particular website. This website happens to be uh, former clients of mine uh, who have done very, very well. So uh, I would recommend you go check out their website. Tell them I said hi, and uh, and this is um, you know you can see exactly what they're doing. But let's kind of go through this definition so you understand a couple of, of the facets of it here. Um, used to uh, upgrade physical assets that are not part of normal repairs and maintenance, okay? Whoops, let me go back. Uh, nope. Let me go back here. Previous. Previous, okay. It's not part of normal repairs and maintenance. Normal repairs and maintenance would be considered an operational expense, and it would be used in the NOI calculation. Capital expenditures, the funds for capital expenditures are not used in the NOI calculation. Now, take a look at this next line. This might help you understand why we uh, have capital expenditures. This type of capital outlay is made by companies to maintain or increase the property. You will, If you go to a bank or most banks, especially Fannie Mae, they will make you set aside reserves for capital expenditures. Why do they do that? because they want you to reinvest in their asset, in their collateral. They don't want their collateral to lose value. So they want you to, have, to every year outlay more capital to maintain or increase the property. It's a way for the lenders to maintain the asset and maintain their collateral. Now, capital expenses have a useful life and can be depreciated. You know, I mean, they can show up on the balance sheet. Um, you know, they will always be aligned. They should be aligned below uh, the net operating income calculation. So uh, that is the difference between capital expenditures and expenses for um, net operating income uh, calculations. All right. Now, let's think about this for a second. This is a great website. I recommend you go check out GreenStreetAdvisors.com. But this is this is should really lay it out here for you. Check out this and all of these documents I will post on the membership site under the group coaching call for for this call along with this recording. So you'll actually have the documents on this and um, you'll be able to figure it. You'll be able to look at it and uh, you'll be. Uh, let me just see. Um, so you'll be able to look at this and get back to it anytime you need to it's, it'll be right there on on the uh on the uh, group site so take a take a look at these they have repairs and maintenance expenses and then they have capital expenditures and they break the capital expenditures down into three types of groups okay and this is actually uh very interesting because this was something that my client and i were going back and forth uh over yesterday uh based upon what the what the seller was saying was a capex and i was saying that was not a capex take a look at what the repairs and maintenance are these are the, these are the expenses that are going to show up on uh on the net operating income calculation Smaller, small dollar jobs and projects, most turnover costs uh, fall into this bucket. It includes interior painting, all right, as opposed to exterior painting, landscaping, snow removal, miscellaneous small dollar building repair items, repairs and maintenance type of items. That's what you'll find in the operational expenses, okay? Now, the CapEx side, let's look at this a little bit differently. They break it up into recurring or non-recurring or infrequent expense, expenditures, and then revenue enhancing uh, things like kitchen and bath upgrades, televisions, extensive exterior interior work, new amenities. Look at CapEx includes new roofs, parking lots, HVAC and window replacement, floor coverings, appliances, cabinetry and exterior painting, okay? Let me tell you what, the, what one line item that my, my client and I were going back and forth over, and then I went in to see my accountant this morning, you know, whose office is right on the other side of mine. He's my property accountant. He's not my tax accountant. And um, 
we have the discussion regarding uh, carpets. All right, now carpets, according to what you're about to see in a moment, uh, carpets would be considered a capital expenditure. And I had an issue with that because on all of my properties, we, we charge it off as an expense, as an operational expense. So, you know, by doing that, we, uh, you know, are actually hurting ourselves a little bit, but it really, it's more of a realistic uh, picture of what, what it costs to run the property. So um, what that means is that the, the cost, according to Fannie Mae, the cost for carpets should be charged off to the property below the line as a capital expenditure, and therefore it increases the value of the property. We're not paying for it. Now, what I do is I charge it off in that year as an operational expense. Who's right? Well, you know what? I'll tell you something. Once you own some of these properties long enough, you realize that a the cost for carpets are essentially a turn cost item, meaning that Every time I have to have to turn a unit, I usually have to replace the carpets, even if the person has only lived there a year. And you're looking at some C-class property. Those people live in those properties hard. I am amazed at I put in new carpet six months later. The people skip on me and I walk in and look at the carpet and it's trashed. I got to go replace it. It boggles my mind, especially to think that I've lived in my house for 14 years now. And uh, and I look at it and I think, man, my carpets are fine. You know, we steam clean them every once in a while. We uh, we um, you know keep them clean and and they're holding up very very nicely. But in in C class property, those those units uh, can burn through those carpets. And I'll tell you something, we don't spend a lot for carpets. So that's something you might want to think about uh, or or talk to your accountant about as to how you want to, those charged off. Now, what does that mean for you when you're evaluating the property? If it's, um, you know, if there's a discussion, what you're going to do is take those those expenditures and you're go the, for the carpets, and you're not going to capitalize them. You're going to put them above the line and reduce the net operating income because that is a turn cost. If you own the property and you're looking to sell it, you're going to take that number and stick it below the line. Who's right? Well, you know, it, it comes down to the, uh, you know, um, you know, standard uh, financial accounting. St uh, standards uh, and determining which is the right category to put them in. The proper category to put them in is to charge them off as CapEx. But, you know, whose side are you on, yours or, or the sellers? So just understand that when you're looking at these expenditures, you're wondering if they're legitimate expenditures, if there uh, should be a CapEx, if there should be a, an operating expense. Okay. Uh, but what does Fannie Mae say? And this is key. All right. Let me do a little presto change over here on my screen. Because uh, I want to show you this, and this particular um, this particular uh, screen is going to uh, let me just jump over here, give you a handle on, and I'm going to post this particular document to uh, the membership site. Okay, here, take a look at this. This is a great document because it really lays out in a in a um, in a text form what a multifamily financial income and expense financial statement should look like, what type of categories we have. This is the document that that first client who was looking for a listing of all the expenses, this is the document he needs to have, all right? And this is when I said I'm going to shift the liability off to a third party. I'm shifting it off to Fannie Mae. So here is a full, complete rundown of all the charts of account chart of accounts that Fannie Mae has for a multifamily property. And this is what we go through in the uh, videos on how to understand multifamily uh, financial statements. Top line, the income, gross potential rent. It explains exactly what it is and how it works. Less the vacancy, less the bad debt, less the concessions, and then adding in laundry income. All right? Just like it looks on a, a, a statement that we evaluate whenever we're looking at a property. These are the textbook definitions of what these categories are. Parking income, commercial income, other income. All right, now take a look at some of these include other income. Obviously, they have co-op unit sales and what have you. But but here's, um, you know, remember what I tell you in that video uh, on the fourth month is there's good income and there's bad income. And I know you think to yourself, what, how could you ever have bad income? Well, 
look at this forfeited security deposits is that good income or that's bad income because when they forfeit the security deposits it means they skip they skip town or that they just they left they gave you notice but when you went in to look at their prop their unit there was so much damage done to it that you kept the security deposit so that comes in as income but is that good income or bad income that's bad income because now you got to take that money and hope that it's enough to fix the damage that was done on that property and most of the time it's not I know mean, a lot of people up here in, in the Northeast you're used to having a first last and security deposit that's what you have to come up with to rent an apartment I'm telling you folks other parts of the country it, you could never get away with that you go down to Texas and you'll get a, a um, uh, you know, first month and a $200 security deposit, or sometimes they'll even waive the security deposit. So other parts, of, different parts of the country handle the uh, the leasing of units differently. Um, and so when you see these forfeited security deposits, you think to yourself, boy, I hope I have enough money in there that I can I can make this thing work. So there are other incomes, a whole categories of other incomes. Here's, here are the incomes that you do not want to include in there you know interest income that's real income but that would never show up uh, as an, a net operating income calculation all right uh, effective gross income the physical occupancy economic vacancy it lays it all out here now here we're in the section of the expenses this is where uh, that that student wanted to have all this information look at management fees administrative expenses and then we break down what all the different types of administrative expenses could possibly be all right you keep scrolling down you know and then what you want to do is you leave out certain types of expenses these are things that would not show up on the administrative take a look at payroll look at all this 401k contributions uh, health insurance commissions um, all the things that you know you think to yourself holy cow um, I'm paying a lot in payroll and yeah you you absolutely are i mean you get the, the payroll taxes you've got the unemployment insurance the workers comp all of those things need to be included in your payroll expenses utilities water and sewer repairs and maintenance appliance repairs auto repairs building repairs all of these things are included in the net operating income calculation all right now check out this um you know repairs covered by hazard loss insurance claims so remember if we look back up here under the insurance under income you're gonna lose the insurance proceeds that should not be considered income all right why because you got to use that money to fix something so typically it's a it's a money in money out scenario so you're not going to use the insurance proceeds and uh, as income and you're not going to use the what, what you lost money on as an expense um, okay, so uh, yeah, check this out. Here, here it explains it all for you. For example, unit painting and unit cleaning are classified as repairs and maintenance, but the replacement of fixtures, such as carpeting and appliances during unit turnover, should be classified as capital expenditures. That's how Fannie Mae looks at it. When I look, when I'm doing my books, I charge it off in the same year as an operating expense. So, you know, that's this is a great document that will explain to you exactly how these things work. Real estate taxes, insurance, and then replacement reserves, you know, using a minimum of $250 per unit per uh, per year. Um, and then it comes up with the total expenses. Now it breaks down the capital expenditure, spend, expenditures right down here. So this document has everything that you need. Uh, if you're looking for a textbook definition of what the categories are uh, on your income and expense statement and um, you know how it all works uh, you know um, questions and comments um, okay th this is this has got nothing to do with us all right so that document will be up on the site uh, by tomorrow all right so let me just jump on back here um, and pause that and where was I Okay, so if anybody has any questions, oh, I got some questions. I start start loading up with questions because I'm coming down to the, like the last slide in a minute. Um, 
Yeah, car carpet replacement of capping. Is it only material or can it include the labor? Um, you know, it, so is the installation of the carpet, does that go in as a, um, as a line item or as a capex expense, expenditure or does that go in um, as a repairs and maintenance or contract services? Um, and the thing is, if, if it's a repair, the answer is if it's a repair of the carpet, it would be considered as a contract service or, or a repair and maintenance charge, typically contract service under the net operating income. If it's a replacement, it would be going under the capital expenditures. So that's, that's how you would break it up. I mean, let me tell you something, folks. You're going to become experts in accounting, multifamily accounting, when you own property. And it's just a game that you have to learn. Uh, it's really not a whole, it's not tough. I was always terrified of numbers. I love, I love looking at, at financial statements now. They make a ton of sense to me. Um, and, uh, and it's just logic. It is just logic and it's beautiful. That's what's so nice about this, about this business. Um, so if you have any questions about it, you can, you can uh, shoot an email to me. If I can't answer them, I'll take them right next door to my accountant. I'll get them answered for you. If any of you want to talk to my accountant, if you're looking to buy property and you're, um, you want to do the property management yourself and you need somebody to keep track of the books, uh, that's exactly how I do it. It's, a, it's the best way to handle it. I never have to worry about my financials. Um, and my financials are every year, every month, they're, they're pre uh, prepared by a CPA. And, you know, just as a little aside, when we got sued by the SEC, they wanted to see the financials on all of our properties. And within three days, we turned over over 4,700 pages of financial documents, and they never questioned one of them. And that's how you need to run your business. So um, just keep that in mind uh, when you're looking. If you want to talk to my accountant, he's a good guy, and he'll take care of you. Uh, but that's all he does is property accounting. He sets up the Yardy system for you. Uh, it's his system. Now, uh, let me just do my last slide here to share. Okay, here we go. All right, um, next slide. Okay, take a look at this. Here's my plug. Another multifamily due diligence seminar is coming up. We're going to do it the 26th through the 28th in June. Uh, in Boston, right at the Embassy Suites uh, in, in East Boston, right next to Logan Airport. Note that you know my, my multifamily due diligence is a two-day seminar, but this one is the 26th through the 28th. All master class members and owner forum members, I'm, I'm uh, you know buying you drinks on the 26th, so we're having a cocktail party uh, up here in Boston on the 26th, 27th, and 28th. We're going to be uh, going through the um, uh, we're going to be going through the uh, the due diligence process, and I'm going to be teaching that for those two days. Um, on the 27th, I'm taking all the owner forum members who are there out for dinner uh, in in East Boston, it's in, you know, in the North End, um, and uh, it's going to be a, a lot of fun. It's a great, great um, uh, meeting. I highly recommend it. If you're thinking about owning multifamily property and buying property, you have to go to this seminar. It's the only one of its kind. Here is the website where you can you can read more about it, multifamilyinvestingacademy.com forward slash due diligence. So go in there and check it out. Uh, owners Forum members have a great discount. Masterclass Elite members have a great discount. And um, the uh, if you're neither one of those, you can – oh, sorry. Here we go. I did it. Uh, if you're not one of those types of members, then uh, you're going to pay full freight, which is about $2,000 for the weekend. Um, so that is it for tonight's call. Let me see if I have any more questions. These documents will be um, – <laughs> oh, for crying out loud. You guys always hear me laugh because there's one wise guy in the crowd here, and he wants to know if he can just come for drinks. Yes, if you want, you can come for drinks. I'll buy you a drink. Uh, but I'd love to have you at the weekend. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, so, all right, everybody, I really appreciate you being on the call. Remember, if anybody has any questions, you can shoot me an email at info at multifamilyinvestingacademy.com, uh, and I'll help you get on board. Hey, listen, I'm, I'm going to make an offer to everybody. Watch for an email probably tomorrow. Uh, I have two slots left available at the 397 price for the May Owners Forum. So if you want in, uh, I had two people back out. I have, I have two spots for the May 
owner's form at the 397 price after this beginning in June, it's going to be 497 until it go until I get to my my maximum, and then I'm going to start going up on the price even more. So if any of you, and I'm regardless of where you are in the uh, in the three you know in the master class program, if you're just getting started but you've got some experience, uh, you I will more than be ha I'll be more than happy to let you into the owner form. Uh, just shoot me an email at info at multifamilyinvestingacademy.com and we'll talk about you and make sure it's right for you. Uh, but other than that, folks, that is it. And uh, I will talk to you all in two weeks when we do an interview with an investor and you can ask them any questions you want. So thanks, everybody, and I will uh, talk to you soon.